Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, so we're going to talk today about API integration. Um, and we're going to start with the first thing is just to remind us about what is an API integration. That word and that terminology is not always 100% understand depending on the personnel. So the definition, uh, well, yeah, okay, perfect. So the definition of an API integration, basically it's just consuming a bunch of APIs endpoint and building some stuff with that. So probably you all think that maybe you're building API integration or maybe you didn't think you were building API integration, but clearly you're doing so. And we're going to take a look in depth about some of the best practices behind and what we've learned from the industry by actually talking to many of you. So a bit of history first. So I'm Guillaume, I'm the CEO of Bear, and Bear, I'm go just going to say that, it's just a developer tool to help you build and manage your API integration. And I've been like CTO and VP engineering for over 12 years, and I've seen the beginning and the rise of APIs, and we all thought probably at some point that the life of a developer by experiencing APIs and consuming API is going to be better. And actually what we we're struck with is that every year that is passing, we're just adding new layers, new technology, and the life of the developer actually consuming all those API is not, is not better. We're still consuming SOAP API, it does exist, yes. We're consuming REST API, now we're going to consume GraphQL API, and so on. So we're just adding some new API, some new technology. And we think that's obviously a big issue because in the world you live in, you need to consume more and more APIs every day. So let's remind us something that the APIs is basically a tale of two worlds. The first time, and as an industry, we've been focusing on that part forever, is basically building an API. We help developers, we help companies build APIs, document API, test API, and so on. But for the most part, we actually forgot the other side, is actually the developer that is going to integrate those API that is going to look at your API. Your API is not the only one that uh, is going to work with, and is going just to discover probably a new technology, a new way of dealing with that API, and so on. And the, the challenges for that developer is obviously very, very different than the challenges of the one that is actually uh, building the API. So we first asked ourselves, who actually builds uh, integration, and API integration, and why? So we did conduct uh, a survey across about 50 different companies from uh, different stages, um, and we asked a few bunch of questions. The first thing is, who did we interview? And I think it's pretty important and pretty relevant to not have any bias behind. So we did interview a bunch of companies, obviously at seed stage, which is interesting, uh, but up to IPO company and at m and stage, with like hundreds or thousands of employees and to understand are there any differences behind about their usages of APIs and how they build their integration and what are their challenges. So we ask the first basic question is, do you consume third party APIs? Do you build API integration? So obviously, and as probably all of you here, you're doing so. The only one that actually said no is actually open source a uh, fully open source software company, which you understand uh, quite easily why they don't, because it's a bit harder to actually distribute your software. So the question is why do you use third party API in your product? The first aspect, and we've seen that rise since a few years, is actually to build your core product by using API first product, because you don't want to reinvent the wheel, you want to go faster, so you're not going to build the next search engine, you're not going to build the, the payment system, etc. So this is usually the first uh, time a developer uh, in a company is going to use a third party API. And then at some point, it's just about accelerating your growth. Uh, because you're going to want to integrate with uh, your ecosystem. You want your application to communicate with what the other application uh, your uh, customers are using. And there is a saying today like integration is the new partnership, and I think you've seen that from quite a, a bit of time now with Intercom with their marketplace, all those software companies, when they start to actually have a partnership, it's just about integration. And you can think about integration with Salesforce, obviously, with Google Drive, with Slack, with QuickBooks, with whatever SaaS software out there. Like, if your software is not uh, connected to those ones, like the chances uh, you're going to be relevant and, and stick it to your customer is obviously lower. So those are the two big aspects of why you're consuming third-party APIs. So obviously most of the companies, they start this way. So every respondent basically said, yes, we're building our core product by using third-party APIs. That's why like the Twilio and so on are so successful today. But also to accelerate their growth, 
most of them, actually close to 90% of the respondents, they said yes. We actually accelerate our growth, we're building new features, uh, we're making our product more relevant to our user because we're integrating into that ecosystem. And when you take a look at who doesn't accelerate our, their growth with third-party API, it's interesting because the majority are actually seed-stage company. And this is pretty obvious at the end of the day when you think about it, it's because they're just not ready to accelerate their growth, they're still finding their core product and their market fit, so they're not yet at this stage, and also they don't have the money uh, to actually build those third-party integration and to manage them. There is obviously uh, a few on Series uh, B, also Series A, Series B, that, that don't yet, but the vast majority of those who said no are clearly the smallest company. But an interesting aspect is that it's changing dramatically. If you take a look, and if we asked that two or three years ago, the differences would be way bigger, uh, because as we've seen from a trend in the industry, companies that tend to start now building their product, they need to have integration right away at the beginning. If not, their product is actually meaningless, not relevant. Like the standalone product, the era of standalone product that worked by themselves without being integrated is mostly over. We've done all those products. So now you need to actually be integrated at day one, which is even more challenging because of the cost involved behind. So, the thing is, eventually, we all build integration, wherever you are. You're an enterprise, you're like a small SaaS vendor, or you're a SaaS vendor that is actually expanding. But the thing is, what we discovered by discussion in depth, it's actually pretty painful. Uh, it's, it's painful, but why is, the, is it that painful? So the first aspect of the pain that you encounter is when you start building your integration. So at building time, if I'm a developer, I'm starting to take a look at the API of X, and I'm going to build an integration. The first issue is the API diversity, what I was saying at the beginning. Like all APIs behave differently. We live in a world without real API standard. So there is different protocols, different format. So always, every time I, I find a new API, I need to actually kind of understand uh, how it works, technically speaking. Then it's about the feature. Like APIs, they do have features. Uh, you think, do they provide an SDK on API client? That's the first thing. Uh, do they do it for my uh, uh, coding language? Do they provide like an event-driven mechanism, like Webhook, for instance? Um, but we'll talk about uh, that later also. Uh, independency, signature, and so on. Like, you all probably have in mind something like Stripe, the Stripe API, which is pretty neat. They, all have, they basically have all the nice feature. But obviously, this is uh, Stripe. And the 99% of API you're going to use are not as well done than this one. Um, and then, there is authentication, which is usually the first big pen of a developer when they start to consume an API. Uh, for very good reason, we move a lot of authentication around API with auth, which is really good for multiple reasons, but the uh, downside is actually the technicity involved and the understanding of developers with auth-based API. Again, there is multiple version of auth, um, and as developers, they don't usually tend to exactly understand how it works. How you manage your auth dance, how you're going to manage uh, your refresh tokens, and there is multiple auth implementation. And that's usually the, a big pain because, well, this is the first thing that you need to do before being able to call any API endpoint. The lack of passing an event driven mechanism is actually a huge pain, not at the beginning, because when you start, you don't actually usually do that, but when you start to scale your integration, you're going to want and you're going to need to actually don't build like a polling and you're going to have uh, a reactive application. Um, and most APIs actually lack uh, async or event driven mechanism for good reasons. It's not that easy to, to actually uh, build. Uh, some have webhooks, not a lot. When they do have webhook, honestly, it's pretty bad usually. Uh, they don't have a retry mechanism. They don't, have, they don't provide you a logging system. They give you like a huge payload with a lot of data that actually don't interest you and so on. And the last thing which is interesting, if you put yourself into the shoe of, a, of an API provider is that the, the level of the APIs and what does the API let you do. Most of the time, you find out that the APIs are very raw. You don't understand the use cases at first. Like you're a developer, you're taking, for example, a look at, I don't know, like the Google Drive API, and you don't necessarily know exactly the product, how the product is behaving, and when you take a look at the API, you don't know what you can do with it. Uh, because the API has been modeled with the data model of the application, and that you don't know because it's not your API and it's not your product again. So when you think about all those things, you need to put that in perspective that you're not consuming one API. You're going to consume 15, 20, hundreds of APIs. And all the time, they're all different, so every of your integration are going to end up being different. And that's only when you think about building integration. But the next thing is that you're going to have to manage those integrations. 
and actually managing those integration is actually more costly than building them. Because while it's true, API breaks, application breaks, and it's going to break. And the thing is, you don't have monitoring and lagging and, and logging most of the time, so you don't know why this API is failing. Again, put yourself in the shoe, you, it's not your API. When you're an API provider, you do have your API gateway. You know what's happening behind the scene. When you're consuming a bunch of third-party API, the issue is like usually you don't build that logging and that monitoring. Um, you end up with usually, and we've seen that like from a lot of companies that actually scale their API integration strategy with over like 30 or 50 integration, they do end up with a huge technical debt because they didn't ask the right question at the beginning. They just thought that it was just about adding an SDK and calling an API. And you end up with spaghetti code, you end up with API calls everywhere, and when you want to change that, well, obviously, it breaks. The number of dependency you're going to manage, I guess most of, the, of developers, for good reasons, when they start consuming an API, they actually use the API client if there are an, uh, an API client because it's just faster. It already takes so much time, so I'm going to try to find a way to actually uh, spend less time. But the issue is at the end of the day, if you build 50 integration, you're going to consume 50 third-party APIs. You're going to have to manage 50 different uh, dependencies. Think about patch, think about security holes. And this is only the case, like if it's the provider um, uh, API client, so it's actually not, not that bad. Uh, but if it's a, an open source and a third party, it's even worse. And lastly, you need to think about, obviously, security at different level, but the first aspect is the, your credentials. You're going to have, like, credentials um, everywhere. You should actually rotate your credential. You should uh, um, know exactly which credential you're using for which API and so on. And that has been actually uh, biting some really big company, and the, retention, uh, the rot rotation aspect is actually very um, uh, complex. If you think that you need to rotate credential without redeploying your application and without touching your code base. And at some point, when you're a bigger company, you don't want your developers to have access to those credentials. So how do you manage that? So one thing to have in mind and to try to treat third-party API and integration the right way is to think that it's basically just a single point of failure. So if you build 30 API integration, you just add 30 uh, single point of failure in your application. And if you start to think about it this way, you're going to change um, the way you start to build those. So if you continue down that road, if you ask a few basic questions, most people don't have any of those answers. How many API do you use? Which API do you use? Which data do you send to where? How often do they fail? What's the latency? Which integration are mostly used? Those are basic questions. Those should be basic questions. But the thing is, if I ask you that question and you have this answer like in 20 seconds, you don't you have to dig into your code base. That's actually a, a big of an issue, and you can, you can understand that right away. And thinking about those questions should actually raise some bigger question about how you deal with those uh, integration. So by discussing and having really in-depth discussion with developers, DevOps, security team at those different companies, we tried to build some best practices. Because as an industry, there are mainly no best practices around API integration, and that's why it's so painful. So the first thing that you need to ask yourself is having an SDK policy. Like, usually, you get that question, is I have more and more update and security issues with the third-party API account I'm embedding. Again, I'm consuming third party, 30 different APIs. Am I going to manage 30 different API clients, update them, and so on? And usually you don't ask that question because you didn't start by just thinking, do you need an SDK policy? Uh, as a rule of thumb, what we consider is like, if the API provider doesn't provide like a, an API client that is more than just wrapping basic HTTP REST API call, don't use the SDK. Uh, you're going to, to, to do a, like a shortcut um, and you're going to pay for that shortcut. It's just basically building technical debt at day one. The next question that you end up asking is how do you deal with async and retry mechanism? Uh, because again, APIs are going to fail, and when they fail, it breaks some of your business logic, some of your process, your data integrity, etc. So how do you deal with that? Because just doing an API call is not enough. Uh, how do you deal with retry? We've seen different things. Uh, usually, we haven't seen anyone actually making every API call going through a retry logic because it poses some other problem, but some critical API call they should do. So they manage 
like job worker queue manager, but you need to think about status code at the end of the day. You need to think about independency. So it's not that, e that, that easy and that straightforward to deal with, uh, but you have to for some critical uh, APIs. The next aspect is about your credentials. The different APIs you're consuming, they do have all credentials. So one of the things that you end up asking is, you don't know which credentials you're using for which APIs. You don't know when you update them. You don't know who is actually uh, the response, uh, the, the person in, in, in charge of, that, of those credentials, about rotating them, about updating them, about recreating them, etc. So the issue with the credential is obviously if you do like things correctly, actually you build like environment variable, uh, you make it all your credentials in a central place, but it's usually still in your code base. If it's still in your code base, it means like tomorrow, if you need to rotate your credential, you're going to have to update your code base and you're going to have to redeploy. So that, that's not very handy. And at a bigger scale, the issue is that usually for some APIs, you're not going to want to have developers being able to uh, actually access those credentials. So being able to manage your credential in a central place and not having those credentials directly in your code base is going to be something that is going to help you uh, down the road. Obviously, having different credentials per environment, all those things should be best practices that you should enforce right at the beginning. Code isolation is, is something that, that is very important and most of the people never realize that at the beginning with API integration and it's starting to change a bit and we've seen some really good example about that. Uh, because you end up with that spaghetti code base. We've got, you've got API calls everywhere. And when you're going to want to change some logic, it's going to bite you because you don't know exactly where it is and it's going to fail. So what we've seen, and something that works kind of pretty well, is actually building some kind of microservices uh, between your application and the API. And those microservices are in charge of dealing with calling that API. We'll talk about logging after, but also logging usually. Um, also in charge of transforming the data because depending on what your API integration is doing, like usually you end up transforming the data model of the, of the API in front of you. And so by thinking about code isolation at the beginning, you obviously gain uh, in the future about your technical depth, but you're going also to be able to probably build better integration at day one. And microservices is a way, it's not always the, the, the right way, you can build modules, try to make sure that at least all your API calls and every interface, external interface with those APIs are actually isolated from your business logic. You don't want to have the glue logic next to the business logic because it's going to fail at some point and you're not going to be able to change the API you're running on very easily. Logging. Um, logging is one of the biggest and most important aspects when you start to think about managing your API integration at scale. You want to know what's happening behind the scene. So again, it's going to fail because your provider is going to fail, the network is going to fail, whatever is going to happen, it's going to fail. Uh, and the first thing that we discover is most of the time, nobody are actually logging API calls properly. Because yes, you do have logging in your application, like everybody, but when you realize that logging an API call, it means logging the headers you send, the payload, the status code, you need to log all of that, the latency of the API, etc. And out of the box, if you use an API client provided by the provider, it doesn't help you do uh, any logging. Um, so usually you custom build that. We've seen some people successfully kind of building microservices, again with code isolation, that are uh, solely responsible to call API without using any SDK, and they build login inside those microservices, so they make sure that every API call is, is fully logged with payload, status code, request order, and so on. The issue is obviously when you log everything, well, you're going to log a lot of data, and some of those data is pretty sensitive, so you need to think about filtering, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a whole aspect to take care of and to think about for every API you're going to use. And once you've got logging, oops, you know, once you've got logging, you're able to do something next, is the monitoring. Because monitoring, again, is it failing? Do I know uh, when it's failing? Because usually we've all been there. I don't know what's going on, but it, does, it, do, it doesn't work. Or it doesn't work properly. Um, it's really unreliable. Um, and the issue that you've got is because you don't know what's happening behind the scene. Because you didn't put logging in place at the beginning, you're not able to know exactly what's happening. Which, um, what, what's the latency of, of that API, for instance? Um, you're not able to know uh, why is it failing? What's the status code? Oh, maybe we crossed our rate limiting. All those kind of things. And you're able to do that once you've got logging in place. You probably use monitoring tool, 
pretty cool. Uh, but you need to feed those monitoring tools with the right data. And usually your application doesn't provide that level of data when you call third-party APIs. And alerting is kind of the last piece of that puzzle uh, when you manage it. It's like, since you've got logging, you know what's happening, so you can build the right monitoring, the nice dashboard, and so on. And then you can actually get alerted because it's always an issue when your integration and your application is breaking and that's your customer that tells you that it doesn't work. Uh, and 